Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending you upon what my father promised. I'm sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If I had a dollar for every time someone asked me a question in the past year and my answer was, that's still up in the air, I would have a lot of dollars. Lots of things are still up in the air, aren't they? Whether we're going to need a booster for this vaccine that many of us have had. Whether we'll be gathering in here for the foreseeable future or if we're going to have to go out in the parking lot again. It's up in the air, isn't it? You know where that expression comes from? I had to look it up myself. The expression up in the air has been around since the 1700s, and the best guess of why it means what it means is just to be uncertain or unsure about something, not to have a definitive answer, comes from tossing a coin. Think about that. If you toss the coin, you don't know while it's what? Well, it's up in the air. Well, today we're reading this story, and I really think a lot of times we neglect the story of Christ's ascension. We say it in the creed when we recite the creed. We're not a creedal church. We don't say if you don't believe exactly in this setting, this, these words in this order, that you can't be among us. We use it as an affirmation of faith, one of the earliest affirmations of the church, that Jesus ascended into heaven. So we sort of say we give it lip service. We don't really think about what it means. And I think this is a crucial passage for us living in the world today. Because not only does it ask a question, it answers the question. We'll get to that in a moment, though. Jesus is with his disciples in both accounts, both the same story written by the same author, with just a little bit of different focus on each one. Forty days after he has been resurrected from the dead. Forty days. Forty is an important number in Jewish and in now Christian understanding. Forty days and forty nights of rain for Moses on the ark. Forty years in the wilderness for the Jews wandering in the desert. And now on the 40th day after his resurrection, he gathers them together and he says, I'm giving, all authority has been given to me and I'm going to give you power from on high. Just wait for it. And they watch him go up into the clouds. Now remember, clouds are important too because the cloud came on the mountain when Moses was there and God's presence was in the cloud as God's presence had been in the cloud when they were traveling for those 40 years in the wilderness. So the cloud comes down and Jesus is gone from their sight and they stand there staring up into the sky with their head in the clouds at that point. If you read my newsletter article, I've said I love Pentecost. Pentecost is a great story about power and proclamation and fire and wind and all this great sort of special effects that happens. But I really get the ascension, because I think I would have been standing there staring up into heaven going, wait a minute, come back. It just gotten him back. He'd been killed. He'd been crucified. He was buried in a tomb, and then he was back with them, and now he's going again. And I said in my newsletter article, it always reminds me of the Wizard of Oz, when the wizard takes off in the balloon without Dorothy and Toto along. And they're saying, come back. And I said, that's always followed by the unspoken. We don't know how to do this without you. But just as there had been men in white standing outside the tomb who said to the women, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. They're saying, why are you staring into the sky? He told you what's going to happen. Now, it's amazing, isn't it? They're still looking backwards because they're saying, Jesus, is this the time you're going to restore Israel? Is this the time? They're looking backwards. They want things to be the way they were when David was king. They want Israel to be a power among powers. And Jesus has to open their minds to understand the scriptures, to see that his kingdom is not of this world. And then he's taken from their sight. But before he goes, 
he says to them, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem. You'll be my witnesses in Samaria. You'll be my witnesses in Judea. You'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So their question is, this the time is answered with a different answer. It's, you will be my witnesses. I've said before that word will, if you're a lawyer or you've been to a lawyer, there's a difference between will and shall and may. You know, you may be my witnesses. It's possible that you'll be my witnesses. You have the power to be my witnesses. It's up to you. What does Jesus say? You will be my witnesses. And where? Here, starting here. The place where they had killed him. The place where he had been put to death. You're going to witness to these people. Then you're going to go where? Samaria. What's in Samaria in this time? Samaritans. We don't like them. And we're supposed to go there and witness? throughout all Judea. Now remember, these are folks from Galilee. These are people from the look-down-upon poor section of town in this nation. You're going to be my witnesses here and to the ends of the earth. Well, let me tell you what. Cockeysville, Maryland, Hunt Valley, Maryland, if you're not from the era of saying the Apostles' Creed this way, is the end of the earth for these folks. We are here because they took seriously the call to witness. Because look what did they do. They worshipped him. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. This is before Pentecost. This is in John's Gospel where he's breathed on them with, when Thomas is not there and they receive the Holy Spirit. But this next week they're still hiding. This is Luke's account where we are waiting for the great outpouring of the Spirit on all flesh. We're waiting for what Joel had prophesied so many years before. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Because when the day comes, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, all people. All of them will be empowered to witness to my power and my glory and my majesty. But here they are, returning to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God, no longer afraid to say that they belong to Jesus, who is the Christ, that they understand that this is God's Messiah who was raised to new life. They are not going to be afraid anymore, and they're going to witness. And we are here today because of that power from on high that clothed them and lifted them up and filled them and sent them into the world. This is one of those times we have to look back in order to look forward. And I think that's going to be what I'm looking at next week is too. Looking back and moving forward. Looking back to the truth of God in Jesus Christ, to his resurrection, which is why every now and then it is a good thing that we do when we recite one of these affirmations of our faith. It's a good and wonderful thing to remember what it is that we believe and to say it out loud together. But we have to take it seriously, don't we, in today's world? Because there are people living within the sound of my voice, which is going to travel through this neighborhood, who do not know that they have a Savior. They do not know that they are loved. They do not know about grace. They do not know about power. There are people who feel so disconnected from everyone right now because of COVID and even before COVID, they have felt disconnected from one another. But we have the way to connect them, don't we? Because we have Christ in our midst. He's in the sky in the sense that he's up in the air because he was taken from their sight in the clouds and is seated at the right hand of God. But that's not about being away from us. That's about being who he was meant to be in power. But he is still with us because he's within us in our community. He's within us in our fellowship. He's within us in the sacraments of the church. I'm hoping that we'll be able to start baptizing soon again. I've had some calls about baptism from people in the community who have had children during the pandemic who want them to be baptized into the family of God and Jesus Christ. I want us to be able to share communion. Even remotely, we're still connected. But look at what Zoom has done for us. And I am so tired of Zoom. I've got to order three new pairs of glasses because of Zoom. I've stared at my computer so long my eyes aren't working anymore. I have one prescription for distance. I have one prescription for the computer, and then I have the trifocal so I can come out here with you all and see you and read at the same time. But without Zoom, we wouldn't have been connected. And with Zoom, we've had people all over the country attending our worship services. We've had liturgists who have appeared from Liberia. They're not, they may seem like the end of the world from us where Nathan and Anna are, but no, we're the end of the world for where these folks were. They knew where Liberia was. They knew where Africa was because all they had to do was go south.
They did not know about us then. But we are here because someone told someone, told someone, told someone. If you tell no one about Christ, if you tell no one that he was dead and crucified and buried and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, who is going to know in the future? I don't like it when Christians wring their hands and say, oh, the world is just going to hell in a handbasket. Don't wring your hands. Roll up your sleeves. Take this word seriously because Jesus himself said, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses, just as he had said, love one another as I have loved you. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Again, we're looking backwards because we celebrate Pentecost every year, and some people come to Christ on Pentecost. They'll wander into a church, and they'll see everybody dressed in red. They'll hear the story of the Holy Spirit, and they'll feel something in their hearts tugging at them. But for the rest of us, it's like, why do we celebrate Christmas every year? Jesus isn't born every year. Why do we celebrate Easter every Sunday, much less the big day of celebration? It's to remind ourselves what God has done and will continue to do in and through us. So many things are up in the air right now, but this is not one of them. Christ, who was and is, is to come. And until he returns, as he has promised to do, to claim us all and take us to the kingdom that has no end, until that time, he is with us because he said that. We didn't preach the Great Commission this year, but you know those words. It's, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. I will be with you always. I am with you always. But you have to tell somebody because without you, people's future is up in the air because they will not know that they are loved. They will not know that they are given a second chance. They will not know that they are cherished by the one who created them, who sent his son in order to redeem them, and who will be with them as he is with us always. So who are you going to tell this week? I'm giving you homework. Tell someone what God and Jesus Christ has done for you this week. Don't wait any longer because he said, you will be my witnesses. So witness where you live, where you are. Go, over, go wherever your Samaria is, because we all have different Samarias. Sometimes our Samaritans are particular people, people sometimes that we're related to. Sometimes our Samaritans are people of a different race or color or ethnicity. More often they're people that have done things that we don't approve of and we don't want to be around them. So who is your Samaritan and where is your Samaria? Go there and tell someone about the grace of God that saved you and raised you to new life. And then take it into the streets, take it into the Zoom meetings, take it everywhere you go because it needs to go around the world and back again so that Christ, who was and is and is to come, will be made known through you. To the glory of God and our Savior, amen. We're going to sing an old one now. This is a Charles.